What is more important, rate of change or cumulative gains through the year ahead? Well, thanks, John. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on your time horizon. You know, we uh, we service a lot of different clients, so we have to try to appease them all. For on a short-term basis, the rate of change always matters, which is why you know about five weeks ago we started to pivot away from you know, the, the places we've been, which is early cycle beneficiaries and even reopening beneficiaries. Now, we still like the reflationary sort of positioning. In other words, we like value over growth and we like things that are levered to higher rates and higher nominal GDP growth over the 12-month horizon. So we haven't taken down financials or materials and industrials from our overweights. But what we did do is we downgraded consumer discretionary, we downgraded small caps, and we basically advising people to move up the quality curve about a month ago because we're going into this period where, you know, the news is kind of baked in the short term, which is why we think earnings could be a bit of a sell the news event, which we kind of saw with the banks last week, quite frankly, as a precursor to what we might expect. And, and look, at the end of the day, it's still a bull market, but it's getting trickier. And I think, as Kaylee was saying, I mean, these are things we've been highlighting. I mean, if you look under the hood, there's been a lot of damage, right, in terms of, you know, things that are more speculative, uh, whether it's new issue type uh, offerings, uh, whether it's the, um, the lower quality or more expensive stocks that couldn't be justified with higher rates. And so that's all good. Um, ultimately, I think it will get to the high quality stocks too, probably sometime in the next month. Michael, try and avoid the when questions, the time stories, because I think it's almost impossible to tell. You don't have a crystal ball. I try and focus on the process. Just to understand from you, Mike, if you can explain to us the signpost that you would be looking for to re-enter this market and retake those positions. Yeah, so one of them is just valuation. I mean, we're really stretched um, any way we measure it, whether it's equity risk premium, just absolute PEs, uh, in the context of, you know, the rate move that we've seen so far this year. So one thing is just seeing valuations down about 10% would make us feel a lot better. We have a buffer. In equity risk premium terms, it would be sort of 350 basis points on, a, on an S&P basis. Today, we're at 280. So that's a significant move. You know, it's 10% plus on valuation. The good news is earnings are offsetting some of that, right? The other thing we want to just we want to get people to get more realistic about is the execution risk in the reopening itself, right? Dreaming about a reopening is is easy, right? We just you know we know things are going to get better, and we can look forward to it. Nobody has to prove anything. But now, as you actually reopen, companies have to deliver the services and goods at a margin. Okay, so that this is the area we think that needs to be you know maybe curtailed a bit is margin expectations as we reopen because. The reality, John, is that, you know, the lockdown, I mean, it was a man-made recession in many ways with the lockdown. And as a result of that, we've destroyed supply. Um, we haven't, we don't just have not enough, so we, we've actually destroyed supply. And, and we're seeing the beginnings of that in terms of supply chains and labor availability. And we think we have a digestion period on margin expectations for the next couple of quarters that once we see that, then we'd feel a lot better. Mike, where in this market right now do you see that execution risk as being a little bit more pronounced, more acute? Yeah, so that's why we downgraded consumer discretionary. Um, that that is the area we think where you know a combination of expectations are probably a bit too high. There tends to be a lot of lower quality companies in that consumer discretionary space that don't have a lot of pricing power. It's very competitive. Um, so th that's the one. That's one area we're definitely focused on. And and look, I mean, I think there's other areas too, but I think that's an easy uh, easy ground to think about. The last thing I'd say about consumer discretionary, it's a classic early cycle group, right? You want to buy consumer discretionary the day you go into recession. And typically when you go to mid-cycle, as we've been uh, sort of describing, that's when the relative outperformance of consumer, consumer discretionary gets more difficult. Are the airlines a piece of that, Mike? I think so. I mean, you know, I, I do want to differentiate our view. Once again, we continue to like the reflationary stories and, you know, the, the, the rotation that we think is more structural because we're going into a higher velocity economy. We like these things like, you know, banks and materials and some of the commodity complex and things like that. What we don't like as much anymore are the reopening plays, because quite frankly, John, that's where the execution is the greatest, and where the expectations are probably run ahead of themselves. So that, I want to really disassociate and differentiate those two themes.